My name is Deborah Zalik. I'm one of the voice instructors here at Wellesley. And on behalf of the entire music department, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you all to our guest artist this evening, Carla Canales. Carla will be joining us on campus for a number of events during March and April this semester. And she will be showcasing her talents and expertise as a singer, cultural diplomat, entrepreneur, and social advocate. Carla has been a member of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities Turnaround Arts Program. She was selected by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of, as one of its 100 leading global thinkers and won the Medal of Excellence from the Sphinx Organization, which was presented to her at the Supreme Court by Justice Sotomayor. Carla has served as a U.S. State Department Envoy, Arts Envoy, since 2005. One of the missions is creating new arts programs for U.S. embassies all across the world. She is an Advanced Leadership Initiative Fellow at Harvard University and is the youngest fellow in the history of the program. A social advocate and cultural entrepreneur, Carla, Carla is the founder of the Canales Project, an arts advocacy organization that uses performance and music to address issues and promote conversation about cultural exchange and identity worldwide. We are delighted and so excited that you're here with us tonight. Let's welcome Carla. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, as many people I want to thank, but first and foremost, Deborah, uh, because actually today's the first time I'm seeing her in many years since we were uh, <laughs> students together um, several years ago. But I want to begin today with a joke. Great about having friends from other countries. Their English will be good, but then they'll be turns of phrases they don't understand. Yeah, so he walked into the break room one time, and I said to Christoph, I go, well, 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 well. Look what the cat dragged in. And then Christoph proceeded to look around the room. <laughs> and then go, there is no cat here. <laughs> what is the meaning of this? And I explained to him, oh, it's a funny American expression for look who it is. And he goes, this is not funny. <laughs> but then Christoph made it all the better when a week and a half later, he was in the break room, I walked in, and ever so proudly, his six foot eight or six foot nine German looked at me and he goes, look who's dragging in a dead cat. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I think that pretty much sums up cultural diplomacy. <laughs> Cultural diplomacy, um, diplomacy is a word that I think we've all heard quite a bit in the last, certainly in the last few days. Um, broadly speaking, I've listed here the definition of the art and science of maintaining peaceful relationships between nations, groups, or individuals. Uh, and we, we usually use it as a tool to communicate, but what I really want to talk about today is public diplomacy, which offers an opportunity for every citizen to be engaged. A leading scholar on the subject, Professor Nicholas Cull, offers a history of the phrase. According to Cull, Edmund Guillaume, a diplomat and former dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, was the first to use the phrase in the modern meeting. In 1965, Guillaume went on to found the Center of Public Diplomacy at the Fletcher School right here in Massachusetts. Professor Cull offers us five key organizing elements for public diplomacy. Listening, advocacy, cultural diplomacy, exchange diplomacy, and international broadcasting. Exchange diplomacy often refers to people-to-people -people exchanges, and it's usually related to academic settings, whether it's universities or learning institutions. You may have heard of the Fulbright program, which was inaugurated by Senator William Fulbright in 1946. 
The program continues to operate today and is perhaps the largest educational exchange program in history. Interestingly, the program uh, first embraced China as the first country of the partnership. And I bring that up because unfortunately, President Trump canceled the Fulbright program to China in, and Hong Kong in 2020. I'd like to talk about cultural diplomacy today. This is gonna be the main focus of my discussion because it's the main focus of my attention for, for much of the last 20 years. And it's been defined as the exchange of ideas, information, art, language, and other aspects of culture among nations and their people in order to foster mutual understanding. Few diplomatic tools have had such a distinguished history of effectively advancing national interests, enabling connections between international friends or actively changing minds. It's an element in what former US Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, calls the foreign policy toolbox. But in order to talk about cultural diplomacy today or any kind of diplomacy, we have to add a sixth organizing element to Professor Call's list. Digital diplomacy. Sometimes it's called e-diplomacy, and it's been defined by the Lowy Institute as the use of the internet and new information communication technologies to help achieve diplomatic objectives. See, a lot's changed since Ambassador Guillon first used the phrase public diplomacy. We now live in this global ecosystem where technology has redefined how we communicate. And thanks to the proliferation of the internet and smartphones, pretty much every person on the planet can be connected to pretty much everyone else. So if we think about that, in this digital era where the general public can play a more participatory role, there's a huge underutilized opportunity for public diplomacy and for diplomacy at large. Today I want to discuss America's experience with cultural diplomacy, some of our successes and some of our failures. America has wielded its influence around the world through television and films and music. And of course, cultural diplomacy aims to harness America's culture to promote understanding. However, key questions remain unanswered. And one is defining American culture. America's, America views itself as a melting pot of cultures. And I think that we could learn something from our northern neighbors in this regard. Canada describes itself as a mosaic, a multicultural landscape symbolizing a national ideology of inclusivity. Our melting pot is more of a source of confusion and sometimes pain and social strife. So what is American culture? What does it mean to be American? As a first born American in my family, I've grappled with these questions my entire life. My mom is a Mexican immigrant and my father is a Bulgarian refugee who came to this country with $20 in his pocket. So as a child of coincidence rather than globalization, I had these two very different cultures to learn about and a third one to assimilate to, the American culture. I was a hybrid, born into a state of cultural confusion. And the only way I could survive was to become a chameleon and learn to adapt to all of them. So I suppose I first learned about cultural diplomacy in what I think might be the best way possible, by doing it. I gravitated towards singing at a young age, and I became a US State Department arts envoy early in my career as an opera singer. Uh, this quote tells you a little bit about that program. In 2005, I was invited to compete, uh, complete my first Arts Envoy mission in Mexico. The program took place in Campeche, which is an area with pretty low tourism. Given the immigration challenges, the U.S. Embassy wanted to connect with this underserved area, so it was one of the very first programs in the region. 
As a community with a large indigenous population, the government officials were working closely with Mexican government and regional delegates to better understand the demographics and how to connect. And as they were getting to know each other in discussions, I had this task of creating my first program to foster mutual understanding. The reality is that while diplomats have the best of intentions, it's usually the artists that are the ones who create the actual programming through which the cultural diplomacy is to take place. And it's not an easy task. Sometimes arts envoys are briefed on foreign policy objectives or the histories between the two countries, but in my experience, most of the time, it's just up to the artist to become aware of these histories and take it on themselves to create a program. In addition, there may be a language barrier or cultural hurdles to overcome. In this instance, I speak fluent Spanish, fortunately, and even have citizenship. But many of the constituents in Campeche spoke Mayan dialects, and many of them were indigenous people who were already skeptical of any kind of government. On the other hand, just like artists may not have intimate knowledge of foreign policy, foreign service officers might not have any experience with the arts. Many diplomats have relied on older models, like the traditional touring model. There's nothing really wrong with this, but I think that a lot more is possible if we try to see creative programming. Performing can be like a lecture. The performer showing the audience something that they might deem culturally relevant, often with a Western bias. But this can be thought provoking, but it's not really participatory. And there's no real exchange of cultural values or equity. So maybe this is a nice moment to just take a break because I feel like I'm doing exactly that thing that I was hoping I wouldn't do, give a lecture and, and reflect my own values. I'm here with a lot of joy in my heart because I'm really hoping to get to know each of you. And though it is my, my responsibility today to tell you about cultural diplomacy and, and my experience with it, I really hope that throughout the next few weeks while I'm here on campus that I'll have a chance to get to know you. And I'm certainly gonna be passing around my email and I really invite you, if you're willing and have some time, to uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. What does cultural diplomacy mean to you? What does art mean to you? What does it mean to you to be American? Or maybe you're not American. What does citizenship mean to you? Well, back to Campeche. While the team at the embassy was planning the schedule, I kind of wandered into the streets and saw these kids and decided to join in this impromptu soccer game. And they were pretty amused because I'm a lot taller than most, most uh, of my Mexican family relatives and most of the folks down there. But soon enough, we started sort of laughing and, and playing and, and I wanted to sing for them just to show my appreciation. But to my surprise, they wanted to sing for me. So when the embassy team emerged, I told them I wanted to invite the kids on stage with me. Over the next few days, we performed and rehearsed, and we worked with a local organization that was trying to use the arts to help their educational programming. Long story short, within a year, they went on to perform with Andrea Bocelli. They won a Coming Up Taller Award, which was given to them at the White House in Washington, D.C. And of course, offering a presidential award to an underserved community sent a strong political message. And it did help to ease tensions related to immigration issues. But perhaps more importantly, it offered funding to La Chacara, the, the uh, organization I mentioned, which is now a cultural hub that offers workshops and classes to the entire community. Not all State Department cultural diplomacy missions are as successful as that first one was, but there's certainly been many that have been far more impactful. I want to share a few examples of how cultural diplomacy has made a really significant difference in American history. Bear with me one moment. You may be surprised to learn. It all began with a moose. As he was with so many things, America's first uh, Secretary of State and third President, Thomas Jefferson was a pioneer of cultural diplomacy. While he was ambassador of the United States to France, he began experimenting with cultural diplomacy. 
He wanted to rebunk a claim that was made in 1770 by a renowned French scientist, Comte de Buffon, who was eager to convince the French public that America was degenerate. Jefferson, also a scientist, felt that illustrating the extraordinary diversity and richness of the North American wildlife was one way to reveal the promise of America's scientific sophistication. When he arrived to France, Jefferson arranged for a large stuffed moose to be sent to Buffon. And the gesture did make a big impression on him, and he promised to retract his claims. Jefferson's colleague, also an emissary to France, Benjamin Franklin also chose wildlife as a way to convene the American frontier spirit. He was often seen in the finest salons of Paris sporting a coonskin cap. These were early forays into alternative diplomatic processes, and they didn't immediately translate into any formal cultural diplomacy programming. Actually, America was encouraged by its first president, George Washington, to avoid foreign entanglements and the international agenda was quite limited. It consisted primarily of just protecting the borders and maintaining its ability to trade internationally. On a global scale, during the 19th century and up to the middle of the 20th century, the US was primarily an observer, but America's leaders couldn't help but notice that when the Congress of Vienna was convened to help resolve the division left by the Napole Napoleonic Wars, a composer named Beethoven was invited to participate by composing musical works in honor of gathering the gathering and its goals. He not only produced the seventh and eighth symphonies in Vienna during that Congress, but he composed his next work, the famous ninth symphony, to celebrate the peace achieved by the diplomats. What better way to communicate the importance and aspirations of that event in an era than such a soaring and profound piece of music. The Ode to Joy from the Symphony's Fourth Movement has today become an anthem of the European Union and people around the world still celebrate it and draw upon for the message of brotherly love. I'm gonna skip forward to the good neighbor uh, policy. Throughout the first century and a half of its existence, the US was not actively seeking to export its views. But once we get to uh, American President Franklin Roosevelt, he recognized the power that culture gave a nation. At home, he pioneered the fireside chat radio broadcasts, and around the world, he and his team sought to use the cultural firepower of the US to send a message of American strength and values to friends and enemies alike. In doing so, Roosevelt really laid the foundation for U.S. cultural diplomacy. During his inaugural address, uh, he framed the good neighbor policy by saying, in the field of world policy, I would dedicate this nation to the policy of the good neighbor, the neighbor who resolutely respects himself because he does so respects the rights of others. At the core of the policy was a decision to reverse years of U.S. military interventions. An artist associated with this policy was composer Aaron Copeland. In many respects, his background made him the ideal candidate. He had studied in Paris, and he had really befriended a group of expats there, including writers such as Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein. He'd also traveled actively through Europe and later in Latin America. It helped him develop both a sense of cultural awareness and sensitivity. He especially developed an affinity for Mexico, and in 1936 composed what many consider to be his breakout piece, El Salón México. So given his background, his growing prominence, and his artistic outlook, he was a natural candidate for the government to look to. In 1941, Copeland embarked on his first goodwill tour of Latin America, and his mission contained both a mandate to listen and to influence. Considering that Latin Americans were accustomed to a more classical style, not Copeland's modern style, you know, there were some critics. Lima critics in Peru were intrigued by Billy the Kid, with one implying that Western United States was as exotic as Latin America. Copeland also traveled to Santiago, Chile, where he performed his own jazz-inflected piano con concerto. 
These concerts were well received, but some of them also remained a little bit resistant. This was, of course, the reason for the good neighbor policy in the first place. Copeland's appreciation for local artists helped blunt the criticism and warm views. He also praised Latin American composers for resisting European influence. He became deeply familiar with their works. He called the work of Brazilian composer Hector Villalobos astonishingly original and praised the work of Argentinian composer Alberto Ginastera, admiring the use of folk music in his work. There are several ways to measure the success of both Copeland and the outreach associated with the Good Neighbor policy. For example, Copeland had many missions to return throughout his life to Latin America. More importantly, the Roosevelt administration relationship improved in the hemisphere. As a sign of this, FDR traveled to Mexico in April of 1943 to engage in the first face-to-face -face meeting between an American and Mexican president in 34 years. Of course, cultural diplomacy was just one factor, but it was an important job in the healing that needed to be done. The Cold War was certainly one of the most innovative times for US cultural diplomacy. The State Department during this time created a number of new programs with an emphasis on human exchanges. When the National Security Act of 1947 was passed, there was a modern structure that was born for US national security community with the CIA and the National Security Council and the White House assigned responsibilities to influence the public. The artistic aesthetics of the United States and of the USSR couldn't have been more different. The Russian tradition was rooted in Western classical romanticism, and American art forms were emerging that were new, and often improv Im it required improvising. So these types of works were really embodied in American dancer Martha Graham. She's often viewed as the visionary mother of American modern dance. But she did not want to be seen as any kind of propaganda, especially during these years where McCarthyism had targeted the artistic community. She stated, I am not a pro pro propagandist on her tour, but paradoxically, Graham's willingness to stand up to the US government, it only enhanced her credibility and by extension, America's soft power. For that reason, and because she was presented she was presenting views of dance that were really uniquely American. The United States government sent Graham and her company to over 27 countries representing every seated president from Dwight Eisenhower through Ronald Reagan. The State Department also sought to highlight music that was uniquely American. In 1956, it launched its best known cultural diplomacy initiative Jazz Diplomacy, celebrated African-American jazz artists like Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, Billie Holiday, Quincy Jones, Duke Ellington. They were sent to international festivals to perform for foreign audiences. Despite the intention to share the art form with others, they were, there was also an underlying message. And in the words of the State Department, this was to confront false narratives and improve the public image of the United States in light of racial tension and inequality. Of course, the narratives about racial tension were not false. The US was in turmoil. Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision to desegregate public schools was handed down just two years prior. The civil rights movement in the US was gaining traction So presenting authentically of African-American music by prominent musicians was a sort of form of counter-programming. While audiences in foreign countries were well aware of the unrest in the US, they were enthusiastically welcoming and celebrating the jazz ambassadors. And so jazz became an instrument for expanding Western power. Almost everything about jazz, from its origins to its artistic freedom, was at the heart in contrast to the formal state-approved fair in Soviet bloc countries. But there were, of course, challenges. 
Louis Armstrong canceled his tour to the Soviet Union in wake of racial violence in Little Rock, highlighting ongoing critical issues for US cultural diplomacy. He did not join the program until 1961 after he felt there had been some progress on these issues. Similarly, the first jazz ambassador, Dizzy Gillespie, grew up in the South and had no illusions about the irony of promoting freedom abroad while remaining a second-class citizen at home. He once refused to be briefed by the State Department, saying, I have got 300 years of briefing. I know what they've done to us, and I'm not going to make any excuses. Despite the controversy, maybe because of it, these appearances had a degree of credibility that no official government spokesperson could have ever achieved. The candor sent a powerful message about free speech in the US. Many Eastern Europeans subsequently credited this outreach with having given them hope and inspiration during the darkest days of the Cold War. And this is a quote by uh, President Eisenhower that really captures the spirit of the era. I'd like to offer one more example, and again, just sort of pausing here, uh, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you fairly quickly. Does anybody have any questions on what, what I've brought up till now? Because I'd love to just take a moment and hear from you. Maybe a show of hands, are these examples familiar to anybody? Oh, great. Well, this, this next example, the third one, is one of the most important in cultural diplomacy missions, and it actually led to our, president, our present relationship with China. But what surprises me about it is that it was completely accidental. From his first days as president in 1968, Richard Nixon had envisioned a connection between the US and China as a key to counterbalancing the influence of the Soviet Union. This was going to be challenging because the two countries did not trust each other. Nixon's ideas were embraced by his national security advisor and later Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. But the moment to make this breakthrough had not presented itself. That changed in part because of a very unlikely meeting in 1971 at a World Table Tennis Championship in Japan. Both countries had sent teams to the event. The event was presented in conjunction with the slogan, "Freedom." I'm sorry, friendship first, competition second. Following an afternoon practice session, American player Glenn Cohen missed the team bus. He'd been practicing at a time with a Chinese player, and when the officials sought to shut down the facility where they were playing, Cohen boarded the shuttle bus along with the Chinese team. During that short bus journey, a Chinese player Zhuang Zhidong seized the opportunity to speak with Cohen through an interpreter. The conversation was friendly, and he offered him a gift of China's Huangshan Mountains. Cowan searched for a gift but didn't have one, so the following day he gave Zhidong a t-shirt with a peace sign and the words from the Beatles song, Let It Be. When the photographer saw the two getting off the bus, it caused a stir, and a journalist asked Cohen if he would like to visit China, which he said yes. Initially, Chinese officials balked at the idea of taking the US ping pong player up on this completely unofficial expression of willingness to visit China. But then their position was overruled by Mao Zedong, chairman of the Chinese Communist Party and the country's most senior leader. On April 10th of 1971, stunning the world, nine American table tennis players entered the People's Republic of China. The visit bred enormous goodwill for both countries, and of course, Nixon and Kissinger seized the moment, and a series of secret negotiations then led to Nixon's visit to China the following year. In February of 1972, that historic visit took place, and the Chinese ping pong team was also invited to visit the United States. During his visit, Nixon noted that Chinese leaders took particular delight in reminding him that, quote, an exchange of ping pong teams has initiated a breakthrough in Chinese-US relations. Mao himself would coin a phrase, the little ball that moved the big ball. As the preceding examples illustrate, cultural diplomacy can take many forms and serve different objectives. 
Recognizing that cultural diplomacy is an essential component of all foreign policy is a conclusion one must draw from the pages of history. But unfortunately, the United States has dramatically cut back on its budget for public diplomacy after the Cold War. There's been restructuring and eventually the US Information Agency was closed. And that was the main agency that managed most of the programs I've mentioned. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience. Since my first mission in 2005, I've had the privilege of working on different missions in Chile, China, Honduras, Japan, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, Montenegro, Peru, Saudi Arabia, and Indonesia. And in many communities where Americans are not frequent visitors. I feel committed to the groups I've worked with over the years and I've tried my best to stay in touch, particularly with the children, like from that initial tour in Campeche. I learned later that many of them were orphans and now so many of them have gone on to college and I still stay in touch with them. Of course, in 2020, the world as we knew it changed. The impact of COVID was felt globally and perhaps most profoundly by the performing arts community. Most working artists lost all their engagements and contracts due to these circumstances. So I was extremely thankful when the US State Department was the only contract that, that kept their word and honored their commitment. Miraculously, at this time when everything was devastated by COVID, the State Department not only committed to moving on, but they actually increased the number of programs they offered. According to Nancy Zelwinski, the Director of Cultural Programs at State as of last year, the, from March to March, we facilitated 438 virtual programs. One of those programs uh, was something I got to be in, in the mix of, and that was a program conducted by the U.S. Embassy in Honduras. Just to give you a sense of how this works, I was contacted by the public affairs officer and their team, and I, they requested that I create a two-month-long summer program for elementary school kids to focus on anti-corruption and anti-immigration policies that were a part of the Trump administration. So you can imagine that that's kind of a challenge, uh, whether you're in the foreign policy world or in the arts world. But after giving it some thought, it gave me the chance to create what I called the camp of values or values camp by flipping the narrative. Instead of focusing on being against something, I developed a program aimed at teaching kids how to be pro something, how to be pro citizenship, how to be good citizens, which I think is something both of our countries have in common. I taught the kids about integrity, citizenship, and kindness through songs and through stories and different musical activities. By creating songs that echoed these values, the workshop was well received, and the program was entirely virtual, which also allowed for a longer program, and with that longer, more participatory model, I got to know the young participants even better. In addition, recently I've had the opportunity to study the history of cultural diplomacy and exchange views with leading practitioners through my work at Harvard. I've been really very, very thrilled to start this program, The Future of Cultural Diplomacy, on the heels of Secretary of State Tony Blinken's remarks last uh, April. He gave a speech that asserted, cultural diplomacy is an integral part of US foreign policy. I feel that it is, and I want to carry forth the ideas by really bringing together academics and artists and folks from the policy community to take a look at how we can fill this important but often overlooked angle in current policy, foreign policy debates and add a valuable dimension to co-curricular discussions. Uh, one of the things that, that this initiative does is we do a study group on cultural diplomacy, which I invite you all to take part of. It's virtual, and because it's virtual, we have over 2,500 participants from around the world. So it gives us a really great opportunity to hear from people who are interested in using the arts for exchange and to foster understanding, and people from Vanuatu to Mongolia to most recently the Ukraine. 
My Harvard colleague, Ambassador Burns, has described cultural diplomacy that he has experienced firsthand during his 30-year diplomatic career. He has said, as a former practicing diplomat and now current uh, ambassador for the United States to China, culture can connect people when governments can't talk. Diplomats are, in a way, interpreters. I don't mean interpreters of language, but interpreters between two cultures. Some of my key takeaways are the following. Cultural diplomacy is often seen as a luxury or an extra, but it's very efficient. And we should really consider ways to increase available funding and recognize the power of this tool. The training is a necessary part of this. It can offer a valuable, viable option for artists. We're living in a time where we have a surplus of underutilized, uh, underemployed artists, and this is really a way to fill a void of the intrinsic values that are often missing. So I see this as a real win-win, uh, but it does require some standardized training for artists in order for them to better understand best practices. Cultural diplomacy needs a central agency. There are many agencies right now that work on different cultural diplomacy programs, uh, from the State Department to the White House, the Commerce Department to the National Endowment for, for the Arts, the Smithsonian Institute to the US Trade Representative's Office. There's maybe too many cooks in the kitchen. And unfortunately, the resources are not coordinated, so we could do a better job if we had a little bit more structure. And finally, we have to recognize that cultural diplomacy is often changing, and especially right now, as I mentioned, in the moment of digital diplomacy, there's so much that's possible with connecting human to human through any kind of digital media. But at the same time, cultural barriers are falling, cultural idioms are changing, and the tools that promote culture and influence hearts and minds are also changing. So I just want to offer a few final thoughts and then I really look forward to taking some questions. I've always seen my role as an artist, it's not to try to evangelize any one culture. I go back to what I mentioned, I sort of um, a mix of three cultures really. And evangelizing any one culture would in my mind be propaganda. I think the role of an artist though is to facilitate the exchange of views and personal reflections within a community. Culture, in my mind, I define it as a set of beliefs. So if you think about cultural diplomacy as a means of potentially re-examining and even changing beliefs by learning from one another, that's really powerful. But the key is the exchange. When two or more belief systems are exchanged and analyzed and re-examined, there's potential to change them, to alter, and to be broadened. As an artist, I've often heard people speak of music as the universal language, and I, I challenge that assumption. I think our universal is that we share a capacity to feel. We each have this, this way of experiencing the world through emotion, and that's what makes us human. The arts offer us a safe space to explore that, that deep complexity of emotion that makes our shared human condition. But the real superpower for the arts is to serve as a gateway to something even more powerful. And that is our capacity to imagine. It's when you can unleash your mind and your imagination and even for a moment visualize something bigger and better than what you've experienced. That you have a dream, that you have a vision of what's possible and what to work toward. And I know that even a song, even a note of music, can make that happen. I know because that's how I went into this field in the first place. So that's why I believe in the power of the arts and it's why I believe in cultural diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, I am a scholar of how Latin American music has ended up in the United States. And cultural diplomacy is actually a big part of the story. And I was wondering if you could expand a bit more about your experiences of the exchange happening and how it has changed not just you, but other musicians that you have worked with um, in this project. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to grab a seat. I feel, I feel very awkward, like the lecture model that I was talking about avoiding. I'm kind of doing that here. So just pretend I'm sitting among you. Um, there are a lot of examples I could give, but the one that comes to mind most immediately is my first um, long experience in China. So uh, this is off the record, but um, I was invited to China on behalf of the US State Department uh, first in 2013. And while I was touring there, a uh, casting director heard me uh, for the National Performing Arts Center in Beijing. And I received an invitation to come back in 2013 and to take part in a production within the international cast. And then they asked me to stay on and play Carmen, the title role, with the national cast. And what I was told was that they couldn't find a Carmen, a Chinese Carmen, for the national cast. Um, seemed a little strange, but I was delighted to get to do the role, and I didn't for a moment think nationalistically about it. My experience with the international cast was, was somewhat Segregated. I mean, the international cast, you know, the real language barriers and so forth, and so we kind of all hung out, and I was eager to get to know my Chinese colleagues, but there weren't a lot of opportunities for connection. And then when I started the Carmen production, I was absolutely the only non-Chinese in the room. And the mood shifted very, very quickly. Uh, no one spoke English with me. It was kind of rough. I was, you know, tossed here and there and do this and do that. It wasn't that anyone was outright mean, but the mood was so different and I really struggled to figure out why. Um, and little by little, I got to know like the costume ladies and I would go have my lunch with them and sort of, they would always hum these songs and I would try to learn their songs and then sort of the children's chorus, I tried to befriend them. Some of their parents were in the adult chorus. I'm sorry, sure, we got to the orchestra rehearsals and this was a long time, three, four weeks, right? And it, it, was, it was tough, you know? Um, it was cold, it was winter, and it can be very lonely. Um, we got to the orchestra rehearsal, and the conductor, who was, was friendly with me, I mean, he was sort of the only person I felt was somewhat sympathetic, cues in the oboe player for, for a cue, and the oboist does not come in. Cues and the oboist. And um, the oboist does not come in. And he stands up and he turns at me and points at me in perfect English and he says, I do not play for Americans. And it's so funny because I remember that moment and I was so relieved because I had thought the whole time that they didn't like my singing or that it was something artistic. And then I understood, oh, it's because I'm American. Well, I can't do anything about that. But then this flood of other realizations hit me. Like, of course, this is National Center for Performing Arts, a glorious building, 4,500 seat hall, biggest opera hall I know of. Why wouldn't they have a Carmen? Why couldn't they find a Carmen who was Chinese in their, in their national center? What was I doing there? And if I were in their shoes, I could completely understand that sentiment. Um, and we kind of went through that whole journey together. And at the end of the day, after the performances, um, we cried. We, I came out of my dressing room and they had lined up to give me a hug, every single person. And they said, thanks for sticking around. We know we made it hard for you. And I still am in touch frequently with them um, and have since learn Chinese, to study Chinese, I'm a student of Chinese and, and the culture because I realized how ignorant I was and how much I didn't know. And it was one of the most humbling experiences I've ever had as an artist and as a human um, of just really understanding what my role is when I travel in any capacity. 
Um, so I don't know if that answers your question well, well it's, but it's personal. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. You guys are shy. <laughs> well, I have a few questions maybe for you. Um, how many of you, just show of hands, how many of you have heard of public diplomacy before today? Yeah. How many of you have ever participated in a cultural diplomacy program? Whether, yeah, yeah. Actually, we all have, uh, well, this music department has, because we were we presented a, a, an ensemble from Pakistan several years back um, as part of the center stage program mm -hmm. um, from the State Department and National Endowment for the Arts mm -hmm. and NIFA, the um, National uh, New England Foundation for the Arts. So we presented a family show uh -huh. and, and a concert um, right here on the stage, and it was fabulous. Um, yeah. yeah, so. And I also personally in the past was um, artistic director of the San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival, which is sort of a local, regional version of international cultural diplomacy because a lot of the communities that are embedded in the yeah. Bay Area um, meet each other's backstage and it's just this huge um, learning experience and growing experience for everyone. It's yeah, Isabel, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think cultural diplomacy, in my, in my mind anyway, it is limited to two different countries. In other words, I, I, I really do think of culture as a set of belief systems, and your neighbor can have a different set of belief systems. So cultural diplomacy certainly can be practiced within a community. Um, I mean, we now live in such diverse communities that there are multiple cultures. Um, and in particular, in terms of domestic implementations or potential implementations. I think we're at a time in America where there are some significant divisions uh, that could really be addressed through culture. So I'm glad you brought that up. Please. <laughs> hi. Um, hi. I'm, um, hi, I'm an international student from China. And I'm Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Oh, my God. <laughs> you show up. Oh, you're, you're, you're very good. Uh, that was really fun. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I just, especially when you talked about China, I do have a worry. I know that China is a huge country, and I do wonder how far cultural diplomacy can reach. Um, I know that personally, I've seen well uh, how just common people, maybe not diplomats, can also reach a lot of people. A lot of artists from worldwide can um, reach everybody in China. But I'm also concerned because this is a special case with China because we have the firewall and it's hard for us to reach outside um, because we had different platforms. So I just want to ask you what you think of just us, like students who haven't stepped on that stage yet, what can we do, like as people who are capable of just reaching online, can do to maybe reach the same goal? Thank oh, you. I love your question. Tell me your name. I'm sorry. Oh, Amy. 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 I'm really nice. It's really nice to meet you. Um, I have a lot to say on this subject. So right now, I'm I'm writing what was going to first be a chapter, and I think it's going to be a book on this subject uh, because I'm I'm really fascinated, and I think that that moment in China those years ago was a life changing one for me. Um, so I'm digging into asking professionals and students and all kinds of people what would a public diplomacy strategy look like to foster mutual understanding specifically between US and China? Um, and we could go into details about what's said in the press and the, the sort of two superpowers and you know, sort of from the policy perspective, but I am a deep believer that people to people exchanges, public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, and now digital diplomacy can offer individual tactics. Uh, the way that I'm 
approaching this is right now doing a lot of research um, and, and interviews. And I think just to give you a few ideas, um, obviously anything related to music, uh, you know, classical music is booming in China. And it's, it's very interesting to me to sort of understand the, the history behind that. Um, but how much Chinese traditional music do we hear here, for instance? Um, cuisine. I think almost all of us have tried Chinese food or some, some form of Chinese food. <laughs> um, but I think that, that anything that's, that's related to that experience, whether it's holding the chopsticks, learning to hold the chopsticks, understanding rice cakes as they relate to like a spring festival or moon cake with the, the autumn festival, is it? Um, you know, understanding like the different traditions, that's all an educational opportunity. Um, I'm even thinking about how recently Chinese New Year has been referred to in the context of the Lunar New Year. And I, I'm curious your opinion about that because as I understand it, Lunar New Year is not exactly Chinese New Year. Um, Chinese New Year is maybe more spring festival, but Lunar New Year encapsulates other cultures also. Is that so if I were to say to you Happy Lunar New Year, would you how would you take that? I, I, is it I'm just curious. Okay. I know this there has been a debate on this uh, in Wellesley's community as well. I think it really depends on uh, personally I think I, I feel fine with either terms because I don't think the terms is what matters or it's who celebrated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's more about just celebrating it, to enjoy it. Because I, I feel like just having this time to feel the joy of like, um, celebrating New Year is more important than, oh, it should be Lunar New Year, you shouldn't say Chinese New Year. Um, but also I feel like people, because we're in a community that's so diverse, mm -hmm. A lot of people are recognizing that, oh, maybe um, now we're in a diverse community. So uh, when we're here, maybe we should recognize that we can celebrate it together. And um, so I, I know a lot of Chinese interactions are trying to adapt. And of course, um, we have students from a lot of cultures. So yeah, that's, that. no, that's <laughs> a good answer. And I think it is, it's a tricky question. Um, but here's the thing. To, answer, to go back to your, your question and where you're coming from, there's two ways to look at it. Like, one is, my advice to you is anything you do, any seed you plant is making a difference. And I believe very much that this idea of making a difference is like one grain of sand at a time. I, I know we live in a world where sometimes things are go viral and they catapult and that's great, but I'm much more sort of in the tortoise and the hare I'm, I'm sort of the tortoise, like one step at a time. Um, if you have a conversation with someone, like even here, about what is that, what is that controversy of Lunar New Year? What does that mean? If you have a conversation with someone who's not Chinese about something related to your culture and an exchange, each one of those is a seed. Each one of those is an exchange. Each one of those is an opportunity also to ignite a curiosity in the other person to learn more, right? On a bigger scale, we do live in this era in which digital allows these platforms. And I think there's always a question of comfort, like how comfortable are you to do something on Instagram or TikTok or Twitter? Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's not that, maybe it's writing an article or you know, publishing something that, that's researched and has a background. But, any single one of those elements is gonna make a difference. And it's a multiplier effect, because if you take that, that action, and someone else takes that action, and someone else takes that action, and so forth, then we have a movement. Then we're looking at a much wider scale. So sort of the second advice I would give is find your community, find the people that feel the way that you do. In other words, like, I was really interested in cultural diplomacy. I didn't know any, I didn't know any other arts envoys. I knew nothing. And I sort of put this call out as a Harvard fellow and I was like, well, okay, I'm gonna do a virtual event and I'll send it to my friends and ask my friends to send the flyer to their friends. And, you know, I thought maybe five people would show up. 
and we've had 2,500 people. I can't even believe that. So, you know, don't underestimate that also. Just even creating the community of the people that are interested in what this discussion means. And I think lastly, like, I just will say for myself, I sometimes wake up and I think, well, what difference could I make? The divides are so great. The problems are so big. Look at what's happening with Ukraine now. I mean, it, it can be very easy to get kind of helpless and feel like no matter what you do, it's never going to be enough. But I, I really negate against that because every single one of these kernels, every single one of these conversations, they add up. In terms of the Ukraine, to give you a story, um, I was feeling very, very down about that this week. And I wrote, uh, we had a session with the group, the, the cultural diplomacy group on Friday, and I sort of wrote a follow-up email on Monday just saying thank you, and our next session is, and I put the title, I just put like hello in, in Ukrainian. And within 24 hours of that, with the way the world works, I now have a meeting tomorrow morning with folks from the Ministry of Culture of the Ukraine, the Ukrainian Institute, that are in a bomb uh, safe house to talk about how can I help them get their message out? How can I help act as a connector? I didn't know anyone in the Ukraine. I, I thought, there's no way I can help. There's nothing I can do. And yet, within 24 hours, something came up. So don't underestimate the power of your voice and your intention. I think the more act, that you activate that, it's like strengthening a muscle, and good things will come. I also just am a big believer that when you put good karma out, good things come. Hi, I have so many questions, <laughs> but I'm just gonna pick one. Um, I'm wondering if there's any conversation happening in the work you're doing. You're talking about, you know, even this happening domestically, and there's few examples I'd like to talk to you about that too, but I'm wondering if there's any conversations happening about how we start to bridge differences within so-called one, one culture itself. Like there's so much divide within the American cultural political world and that's just you know surfaced more and more and I believe you know social media internet is just exacerbating that. Um, so do you see a place for this in you know, I'm thinking there's there's many nonprofits out there to, you know, uh, uh, let's see what's the word I'm looking for. Um, you know, hold conversations amongst people of different political backgrounds. Um, but can you see this work having a role in in bridging divides like that? Is there a conversation happening there? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, and I think. The key element here, it's not, you know, it's not brain science, it's just listening. Mm -hmm. And I think we often are falling short, all of us, on that, um, because it does require a certain level of patience, and since we've moved into this digital era, our, our patience, our, our waiting time span is, is like vastly reduced. But also I would say in order to actively listen, you've got to engage. And so to me, the, the key is to find the similarity first. That's what's worked for me. I'm sure that there are many other solutions, but even if I'm having a conversation with someone who believes vehemently in things that I cannot possibly understand, I have to find a middle ground. I have to say, okay, we both feel emotion. You feel passionate, I feel passionate. Or, you know, we've both at some point been heartbroken or cried or been hungry or any of these basic things. Okay, that's a place to start. What else? Tell me about when you were a kid. What's your favorite color? Like just find some common ground. And the more that that's cultivated, the more I'm gonna be willing to listen with an open mind and the more perhaps the other person is gonna be willing to listen with an open mind. Why? Because there's been a mutually shared trust. I think increasingly as we look to the future, the currency that's gonna be most precious is trust. And that's something that artists are intrinsically 
taught to, to, to value and to cultivate. Like, you know, when you get on a stage, whether it's to speak or, or certainly to perform, you're, you can't really take anything for granted. Like, you have to earn the trust of the audience. They might be sitting there, they might, you know, they might like it, they might not. But to really, like, have that heart-to-heart -heart moment, that's a trust that you cultivate. And you don't necessarily cultivate it through statistics or PowerPoints or any of that. Like, it's that human element. And so I think that um, it's first about finding the commonality and, and, the, and sort of some base level of trust. And secondly, it's like, okay, let me listen. Tell me how you see that. What do you think of that? Okay. May I tell you how I see that? And there's a little more trust. And then the third step is, can we re-examine that? Can we look at that together again with this different view? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I do think that regardless of change, there's a re-examining of a belief system that can go on in that process that will give that sort of, I don't want to say doubt, but that sort of you know, when you're in a moment of, of, of action, you might rethink and say, oh, well, this person I met, they taught me something about that. And I, I, that's where I think we need to cultivate. And it's so, it can be very slow and very difficult, um, but it requires time. It's that currency. And we're going so fast about all of these things. Um, I think we really need to re-examine our use of time and trust. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm eating. Oh, no, you're so fine. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm from a southern... Oh, I don't know my name. I'm just going to say it. Hi, I'm Heather. <laughs> Hi, Heather. Um, I'm from a southern Texas border town, and I'm also a Mexican mother. Um, so I was wondering, you talked about your first trip to Campeche. Um, so I just want to know, like, was there anything during your college education that, like, led you specifically focus on Latin America and, like, Latin America during your first mission? Or was I always been interested in culture diplomacy also. Just want to know if there's anything that, like, really stuck out to you that you did in college that, like, led you down this path specifically? Um, I'm going to be really honest with you. I think I was not at my best in college with my own identity. Um, it was really hard for me, particularly in high school, to figure out how to fit in and identify. And I, I grew up in a town um, where, I mean, I don't know if there was another Latina in my school in high school. And now it's, it's changed a lot, but I'm, I'm way older. Um, so at that time, that it was just not a demographic that was represented. And I can recall, like in high school, just wanting to fit in and carrying that into college. And um, when I was like in middle school, I remember I got this really horrible nickname, which I'm encouraging myself to talk about more because it like removes the scar. But um, there was a bully in my class, and he had come up with this really horrible nickname for me, and it was the Mexican Burrito Thief, which is absolutely horrid, but the way it was constructed was that I was Mexican, and Mexicans like burritos, and Mexicans stole jobs from their parents. So like, my parents had come and stolen jobs from their parents, so I was the Mexican Burrito Thief. And so you can imagine, I wanted to be anything but that. I didn't want my Mexican citizenship. I didn't want to speak Spanish with my mom. Uh, even though I grew up in Mexico, actually. English was my second language. Um, and it wasn't really until that Campeche trip, which was after I finished my master's, it was the first time I really went to Mexico as an adult and understood, not with the family, but with the community, like of people I didn't know, what it could mean to be Mexican. It was the first time I started to think about like my own identity and making this on my terms and not because it was in my blood. Um, and so that was really transformational for me. And I guess what I would recommend is if you have a chance 
at some point in college or graduate school or, or, or not graduate school, whenever, to go as an adult to Mexico and spend some time there in, in an environment where maybe it's with new people that you wouldn't be influenced. At least my family, very religious, very Catholic family. And so I rebelled against like everything. I was anti everything I saw with them. Um, I think having that experience as an adult and starting to shape your own identity is a journey. For me, it was one that did not begin until I was like 24, 25. And I regret that I wasn't more aware of that in college. I will say the one area that I did um, always feel connected to was the music. And so as a singer, I did, oh, I always like gravitated to, you know, Latin songs or Spanish songs or Mexican songs. It just felt very natural. Um, so that's also another maybe portal to explore. I have a quick follow-up question, sorry for that. Yeah, do you like Luis Miguel? Possibly the I, I, Yes, I grew up listening to Luis Miguel. Yes. Okay, I put it up, thank you. <laughs> it was like my era, like Menudo, all that stuff. Oh, yes. I was wondering what kind of advice you would have for um, somebody who might not have been as exposed like, to very different kind of culture, um, but mainly just seeing American culture um, in learning different cultures and kind of trying to become connected to different cultures because obviously there are going to be mistakes that arise and it can be a little awkward, um, especially if somebody is like trying to reconnect with a culture that's not really been around in their family. Like I know, I think I'm either third or fourth generation American, but um, like my great grandparents immigrated here, but nobody talks about them. Like they're from Poland and Ireland and Italy, but nobody talks about them, nobody wants to talk about it, the language has been lost, like, um, so, if, like, do you have any recommendations for kind of traversing, kind of reconnecting with culture? Yeah, I mean, that's, that sounds really exciting. When I hear your story, I'm like, oh, there's like a whole, you know, book to be written there. Um, <laughs> and what an amazing journey to go on uh, to, to really uncover that. It's interesting because I mentioned my mom's family, right, um, who's Mexican, and I like grew up there and was there a lot, elementary school. My dad escaped Bulgaria when, when it was communist, and he has never to this day run back. He never wanted to talk about it. So I understand that experience from his side. I was always like curious and asking, and he just did not want to discuss it. Um, and also for me, as an adult later in my 30s, I went to Bulgaria to perform, and it was like, oh my gosh, wow. So my, my concrete advice would be, A, go to the place, like go at some point, maybe not this week, but soon. <laughs> um, find a way to get yourself there, and just let yourself feel what you, what you feel. No one can take away your experience, your truth, right? Um, and certainly if you're talking about Poland and Italy, very, very different, two very different cultures. Um, and I think secondly, and this is like the biggest piece of advice, I was gonna say this earlier, the single biggest piece of advice I would give to anyone studying undergraduate is learn another language. It's, it, it like opens up so many possibilities. Um, it's a gateway to culture, it's a gateway to history, it's a gateway to connecting with different people. Um, and it, it can be a, a language that's connected to your past, and it can also not be. I mean, I've been struggling on Chinese, and I have no connection to China, China but I, you know, it's, um, I'm just passionate about it. And so if there is one advice, like one single thing I would say, is just learn another language, devote yourself to it. It's a lifelong journey, but it will be so worthwhile at the end of the day, and it will help you in everything you do. I'm currently in my second semester of Italian. Trying ah, to get to my mother to learn some Italian, but she's not as interested. <laughs> there are so many ways, also with um, the internet. Like, there's yeah. so many different, um, I mean, we can talk afterwards, but just tools and community uh, spaces. When I was learning languages in college, like, it, you know, you'd have to go to the library and like check out a CD ROM. I mean, that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah, nowadays, like, definitely take advantage of all of that. And it's so exciting. I want, I want to read the book when, when you've written it. Um, <laughs> I am here for you 
you guys. I, I think I've seen one more question in the back. Um, and I, I just want to say, like, for those of you who maybe don't want to ask another question, I just know I'm going to be around for the next few weeks. I want to get to know you. Um, I love treating people to coffees or teas <laughs> or whatever, but I'm, I have a lot of questions for you. So I'm like answering your questions now, but I want to get to know you. Yeah, so my name's Tia. Um, I was uh, lost at your senior, so this um, idea of going and dealing with things with which I'm not used to um, is very uh, prevalent in my mind. But I was kind of curious, and you would talk a lot about kind of like experience and takeaways from personal experience, which is, I mean, of course, valuable. I was really interested in that, like, second to last one of your conclusion takeaways about training in cultural diplomacy, like in, I'm assuming you meant, and like, correct me if I'm wrong, like formal training, if you're in that kind of position. What would, I'm really curious, what was, did you have that? Did they kind of ship you off and say, knowing what you know, teach people what you, you know, like expose other people to yourself? Like, or was there something, is that something that's like missing? Is that something that should be enriched? Just kind of what the experience is in your, like, I guess, formal bureaucratic position. Yeah, thank you, Susanna, right? Yeah. Yeah, is it, that's a great question. Um, no, I have no training. <laughs> this is a short answer. I mean, I definitely had my music school training, which I do feel taught me to think creatively, and that's the key for anything. It's the key for entrepreneurship also, which I think today being an artist and being an entrepreneur is like two sides of the same coin. Um, I am hoping, fingers crossed, to to develop something in this space. Uh, I've been talking with some people, and even if it's a, a handbook or some materials, but I actually think like it's wasteful uh, that the State Department puts all of this effort into this. And other countries, by the way, do this better than we do. I mean, that's for another talk. But um, without really recording what are the best practices, how could the next generation come in and have something to draw from and have a better understanding? Most of the time, I'm not briefed. Uh, the Honduras brief, I threw in there, trying to be unbiased, but I was literally briefed by phone saying, you know, you have to promote Trump, anti-corruption, and anti-immigration policies with third to fifth graders. <laughs> that was the briefing. And I'm like, guys, I mean, I what? I can't like sing songs about anti-corruption with a third grader, you know? But then, you know, thinking creatively, okay, well, anti is against, what are we for? What are both of us for? We're both pro-good citizenship. What does it mean to be a responsible citizen? And so that kind of creative thinking, and, and also, again, but to the point of community, uh, for Amy's question, is just like, who are the other people out there that are struggling with this? Who else wants to do this? I mean, anytime you want to talk, Susanna, I have a whole bunch of resources that I've been collecting on this, uh, lit review, and also like, there are certain things that I think are really helpful, but if you ever just want guidance, I'm like, I'm interested in doing this, and what could you help me to learn from it? Like, I, I'm yours, you know, just let me know, and I'm happy to, to tell you what I know. I think we're at time. <laughs> I think we're gonna wrap it. I mean, I'd love to just say, uh, Thank you so much, Carla. This was just wonderful. Such a thought-provoking evening. I think we all have more questions, more things we want to discover. And um, as Carla so generously said, um, I hope you all will come to more of the events uh, upcoming and take her up on her offer. <laughs> really approach her and, and ask her questions and start to do some more of your own research on, on all of these topics. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank um, the co-chairs of the music department, Claire Fontaine and David Russell, um, as well as our events coordinator, Isabel Fine, and I, my co-voice uh, instructor, Sonia Tangla, for all of their support and um, collaboration in organizing all of these events. Um, as I mentioned, we've got more events upcoming. Um, We'll uh, kick off the next round of things in April with a song recital that Carla's going to give, um, also a vocal master class, um, which is going to feature some of our uh, very talented students, and um, some additional workshops on topics such as building a nonprofit, um, as well as artist as entrepreneur. So 
Um, thank you so much, Carla, for being here, and uh, have a good night.